There we go. Okay. Changes in muscle function. So remember that we are at um, altitude. We're in a rather extreme situation where PO2 is low, so much lower than normal. And that hamstrings the gradient for oxygen to get into the body. So that's where the, that's the source of our problems physiologically with moving to altitude. Low PO2 compromises the saturation of hemoglobin. We saw that went down and it progressively goes down with exercise. And it's the lower carrying capacity morning, that impairs our ability to function. So VO2 wasn't different at any given workload, but we couldn't get as high. There's not as much oxygen in the blood being transported to the tissues. Therefore, there's not as much to consume. VO2 is the rate of oxygen consumption. There's not as much consumption going on. We can't reach the same VO2 max. Similarly, cardiac output is limited. Um, heart rate tries to compensate for a bit of a decrease in stroke volume. And what we haven't really touched on is, is a lot like cold, there's sort of a sympathetic activation. Sympathetic tone goes up. And we'll see that coming into play today a little bit with um, some vasoconstriction that I'll mention. But we are looking at the muscle to see what changes occur there that could explain our reduced function or help compensate for that reduced function. Are there adaptations that occur that might allow us to survive a bit better at altitude? And it seemed at first glance like there were, that this uh, increased capillary density was a way that we might be able to survive and function better at altitude. But this enhanced capillarization wasn't due to a branching out of the capillary network. It was due to a reduction in muscle fiber size that still will change the ratio of capillaries to muscle fibers. But this isn't for the reasons that we expected. It's not a beneficial adaptation. This is a necessary uh, eroding of physical abilities at altitude. And so we, we get a sense of that by exposing the individuals artificially to altitude and looking at some of the metabolic enzymes in the muscle. So this is in uh, the outer portion of the quadriceps, the vastus lateralis, very common muscle to sample and measure these types of changes. And these types of measurements are all enzymes of energy metabolism. Some of these are in the mitochondria, some of them are in the TCA cycle specifically, uh, some of them are in glycolysis. I'm going to draw your attention to a few key ones that happen to change as a result of altitude. And we're looking at baseline sea level exposure on the left, two progressive uh, simulated altitude stresses in the middle. The lower the number, the greater the simulated altitude, the lower the pressure. And then a return to sea level afterwards. So we're really comparing the time course, the progressive response, and then the two sea level exposures. What happened after the whole thing was said and done when we get back to sea level? And there are um, a few changes throughout, but the significant changes are highlighted here. So succinate dehydrogenase is an enzyme of the electron transport chain. Any of these enzymes we use to approximate <coughs> the capacity of those energy systems. So this says the electron transport chain doesn't function as well. Maybe there's fewer mitochondria, maybe there's just less of the enzyme, but there's not as much ability uh, for the electron transport chain to function normally a decrease from 74 uh, micromole per gram dry weight to 53. Citrate synthase is a, a, a marker of the TCA cycle. That big, long, convoluted loop of enzymes, also in the mitochondria. It supplies the electron transport chain. Both of these things are reduced. So overall, our oxidative, our aerobic metabolism capacity is reduced. And then separate from these two, HK is hexokinase, not humokinetics, hexokinase. This is the thing that um, 
stores incoming glucose. It activates and stores glucose coming into the cell. So we want this on hand to be able to make glycogen, to be able to use glucose from the blood, all to make energy. And this is also reduced. So we have this reduced capacity for aerobic metabolism. We have this impairment in being able to take glucose out of the blood to use that for energy. These things indicate energy metabolism is compromised and it can either be because there's less of these enzymes, a lower volume of mitochondria, fewer muscle fibers, fewer enzymes, or just the enzymes themselves are going down. And it seems that it's the first one, muscle fiber size has decreased, the total, it's as if saying um, an enzyme is a classroom and then the muscle is the building. If you decrease the size of the building, you necessarily decrease the number of classrooms. So the smaller the muscle fiber, the enzymes also shrink and seem to erode. And we see the uh, improved capillary density that we highlighted on the last slide. At, at first glance, it seems, oh, this is great. The ratio of capillaries to muscle fiber area goes up in this second uh, sea level after, after a return to uh, normal sea level after altitude stress. Maybe there's an adaptation here that enhances energy metabolism. There's better matching of blood delivery to muscles available to use substrates in that blood. But there's not an expansion of the number of capillaries. The capillary network is unchanged. There's no statistical difference. You could argue there's a bit of a decrease in type 1 fibers. There's not really much change in type 2s. And so for capillary density to change with an unchanged capillary count, fiber area must be reduced. And we just measure that visibly with sections of, of uh, muscles on slides under a microscope, measuring the area and counting the total area of type 1 fibers, the total area of type 2 fibers. And across the board, massive reduction in fiber area in that second sea level exposure. So smaller fibers means less room for all of these enzymes, less room to store glycogen, less room for mitochondria, less room for energy metabolism because we are atrophying at altitude. Normally when we think about atrophy, it's something related to disuse, bed rest, recovery from an injury. If you are really sedentary and you were trained before, your muscles will adapt because you're not using them. We often think of it in that light. This can't be the same thing for individuals at altitude, climbing a mountain. There's no way they are not using their muscles. So this is related to some other stimulus. And we still are actually trying to decipher the mechanisms for this muscle atrophy. And one of the things that we think is, is central to this idea is a really unique protein called HIF-1. And HIF-1 stands for hypoxia inducible factor named because we observe this factor in hypoxia. It is induced when we're, when we're in environments of low PO2 or when the muscle doesn't get sufficient oxygen supply. Hypoxia inducible factor. And we can make this happen by traveling to altitude. We've even observed this with um, uh, perfusion, reperfusion experiments where we'll take a blood pressure cuff essentially and you can wrap it around the leg and cut off blood flow and induce hypoxia through limited blood flow. We can observe an increase in this, in this protein, in this enzyme. Essentially what it does is senses the amount of oxygen available. It's really interesting that we have that ability as mammals, as humans, that we have um, some ability to sense oxygen in the blood. 
And its effects are when oxygen is low, it knows the muscle will have a harder time engaging in aerobic metabolism. You need oxygen to do that. So it initiates a series of changes in the muscle that shift it away from aerobic metabolism. It's like an early warning sign. It knows it's going to have a hard time because the, the PO2 in the blood is low. So it enhances some of these enzymes in glycolysis. It enhances the formation of lactate. And it turns off the entry point for um, glucose into the mitochondria. And it's not necessarily important to understand that PDH stands for pyruvate dehydrogenase. But this enzyme is the thing that connects the cytosol with the mitochondria. It connects glycolysis with aerobic metabolism. And if we turn it off, we disconnect the two. And essentially, what HIF-1 is doing is it's turning off that connection. Which is pretty smart. If O2 is low, there's no point in sending substrates all the way through the mitochondria to find out, oh, the thing that I need to complete my energy production is lacking. So I'm just going to cut it off at the pass and prevent all of this from happening unnecessarily. There's... Um, some suggestion that the, the way HIF-1 senses these changes is through cells reacting poorly to the low O2 environment. If a cell doesn't have an adequate supply of oxygen, it tends to send out signals that say, hey, I'm, I'm hypoxic, do something. And those signals are in are reactive oxygen species, or free radicals, the umbrella term for um, products that spin off from improper metabolism. And so if these are available and they stimulate HIF-1, the actions of HIF-1 will reduce the production of free radicals by shutting off all of this lower half of the diagram. We shut off the electron transport chain or shut down reduce the electron transport chain and therefore reduce the production of these free radicals. This is a negative feedback loop. So this is a simplistic view of what HIF-1 uh, does on the short term. This is how it regulates enzymes of energy metabolism. This also changes gene transcription. HIF-1 is also active in tumors, and is part of the reason that um, cancer is characterized by a shift away from fat oxidation towards heavy glucose utilization. There's a lot that we don't understand about HIF-1. It's not only inducible by hypoxia. It has a lot of other far-reaching mechanisms, but this is one of the uh, schematics that we think is at play when we move to high altitude. So this has implications. This says that, okay, if we're not using mitochondria, maybe we don't keep them up. And this is a large part of why the muscles might atrophy. If we lose mitochondria, we don't need as much muscle. It also has whole body ramifications for climbers at altitude. Really energetic, uh, high energetic demands of climbing. There's some um, reduction in appetite that we're going to look at next. And there's certainly an enhanced reliance on carbohydrate, a reduced reliance on fat at altitude. So practical considerations for eating and drinking, and then also sleeping. The architecture of sleeping is affected by moving to this extreme altitude that add to the physiological stress of climbing a mountain. These are untangibles, perhaps that are related to um, the success of an individual climbing a mountain.
In the background, you can see Kevin Jorgensen, one of the first individuals to climb the Don Wall on El Cap in Yosemite, on his portal edge looking out over the valley in the early morning sun with nothing beneath him. Seems nice. Hopefully you set your anchors properly. Uh, so let's take a look at some of these other whole body effects or ramifications of moving to altitude. This was another major arm of this 1953 expedition, the first successful expedition to tackle not only uh, adaptation or acclimatization acclimation to altitude, uh, supplemental oxygen, but also some of the um, dietary issues that had come up in previous years. There we go. Hydration and dehydration have been important causes of deterioration and weakness at altitude. Shipton in 1935 reported a daily calorie intake of between 1,500 and 2,000 for a period of nearly five weeks spent about 19,000 feet. A Swiss party on the coal had less than half a litre of fluid daily for three days, whereas the requirement is three or four litres. On this expedition, carefully planned altitude rations and effective stoves for melting snow made it possible for climbers to maintain themselves adequately. Although appetites are depressed, Climbers are always willing to drink, and about 1,200 calories a day can be taken in the form of sugar dissolved in drinks. In 1953, records of body weight and urine output showed no evidence of dehydration, and calorie intake, which was up to 4,000 in the coom, did not fall below 2,500 even on the assault. So this, in my mind, has to be one of the major reasons for the success of this expedition. Imagine 2,000 calories per day over five weeks. Imagine that now, here. That's what my fitness pal says that you should have if you want to lose like half a pound a week. We normally eat, what, 23 to 2,800 perhaps? 2,000 or lower every day for five weeks at altitude where your energy expenditure is probably in the 4,000 calorie range. Unsustainable. Massive weight loss. No, no wonder muscle fibers are atrophying. And so trying to really accommodate for this in this uh, expedition is, is probably one of the reasons why they were able to be successful. And you heard the, um, the comment on taking in lots of sugar through the through the tea, through, through drinks. Anytime you're over um, 5,800 meters or 19,000 feet, like they mentioned in the video, the, uh, the added benefit of that drinkable sugar is undeniable. And even still, with that knowledge, we'll often observe 10 kilograms of weight loss with individuals that stay over 6,000 meters. So remember, base camp is about 5,800 meters. Individuals stay at base camp for multiple weeks to acclimate and then try to make their push to the summit. Still massive weight loss, even knowing what we know that um, food intake, increased food intake is, uh, is required. There's not only weight loss due to decreased food intake, but also fluid loss. There was a comment on the video about Swiss climbers having only 500 mils per day. Consider drinking only one small water bottle per day here in normal dry winter conditions at sea level. Probably don't record our fluid intake too much, but I'm sure that it's more than that on a daily basis, probably in the order of two liters total that you'll bring in in a, in a given day. So massive weight loss due to muscle wasting from decreased food, fluid loss, from decreased intake and probably a lot of sweating. And it has to be this decreased food intake that causes the rapid weight loss. We saw VO2 at any workload is the same. The energetic cost of the work is unchanged. They are working, they're climbing a mountain. So they are expending a lot of energy. The reason for their weight loss is due to reduced energy intake. It's not that they're accelerating it because they're wasting more energy than they would doing the activities that they're doing. 
it's that the reduced energy intake creates a massive energy deficit. And it's one thing to measure someone's weight before they go on an expedition and come back and see 10 kilograms different, big question mark in the middle. Maybe they had a religious experience up on the mountain and they decided not to eat so much. But it's another to measure it in the lab like we're doing here in the Operation Everest 3 experiment, which was uh, focused largely on amount and types of food intake, voluntary food intake, in relation to total energy expenditure at different altitudes. So normally at sea level we'll eat what's that 13,000 kcals in climbers doing exercise. This is probably 4,000, 3,500 kcals in these really fit highly active individuals and that matches their energy expenditure. So these open triangles are the amount of energy they need, basal metabolic rate and then activity performed. And what you're noticing obviously is a progressive drop-off in total energy intake. We can look and see where that drop-off is coming from. It doesn't seem like any one thing is particularly, um, is particularly responsible for the decrease in food intake. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks all seem to, uh, to go down. And it's not that the food was unpalatable. This is an excerpt from the paper specifically, giving you an idea of what breakfast was, what foods were on hand for dinner, and that there was an adequate supply, freely available, chocolate, Snickers, biscuits, nuts, cake, sticky buns, at their leisure. There's just a, a decreased desire to eat at altitude. We're not even sure why that decreased desire to eat exists, but we can measure it. This is um, a subjective depiction of feelings of hunger and satiety, and they should be equal and opposed. If you're hungry, you're not satiate, uh, satiated. If you're satiated, you're not hungry. And what we're looking at is a visual analog scale representation of these feelings. Because it's hard to put a number to a feeling or an emotion. Someone can ask you, how hungry are you? And you say, very. But what does very mean? How does that compare to what you felt this morning? So a visual analog scale is just uh, a scale from 0 to 100, or it could be a, a sheet of paper with a scale from 0 to 100 centimeters. And then you're asked, make a mark on the sheet of paper where you feel your hunger lies, or where you feel your satiety lies. 100 being complete feeling, 0 being no feeling. And so you'll make a mark here at predetermined intervals. These are every few minutes at either sea level, 0 meters, 5,000, or 6,000 meters of altitude. Now just focus on the squares that are fixed in the middle of the diagram to start. These are the sea level responses. And as you start out the experiment, feeling quite hungry, also not feeling sati uh, satiated. When you're given a meal at time point zero, those feelings decrease slowly. The meal is processed slowly, your hunger eventually falls. Better part of an hour later, you don't feel hungry anymore and you're fully satisfied. But as soon as you move to altitude, for whatever reason, be it hormonal or be it some enzyme or something to do with PO2 getting to the brain, we're not sure. As soon as you move to 5,000, and this is compounded moving higher, this relationship shifts. And what does it mean when we say it shifts? Two things. You start less hungry. And when you eat the same meal, your hunger goes down faster. So you start off not wanting to eat, and then when you eat, you are quickly satiated and that stops you from eating further food. This is obvious at 5,000 meters, and then even more obvious at 6,000 meters, the circles. So two-pronged approach. You, you are less hungry initially, and then in the face of a stress where you eat a meal, an energetic stress, your hunger drops sharply, satiety increases sharply. So this is working against you 
in your attempts to try to maintain adequate energy intake. This is bad for all the reasons that we've already talked about. What we can observe in, um, we're getting into a, a little bit of a, a nutrition realm in this, in this point. I think it's also important to not ignore that fact. It's the second half of our energy balance equation. Do more, eat less is really what could summarize um, and put me out of a job. But nutrition, obviously very important to, uh, to keep in mind. And in the context of an expedition to altitude where you need massive amounts of uh, calorie intake, we observe absorption is decreased. Not only do you not want to eat, but when you do eat, you feel less full and you have a harder time harnessing that energy. Specifically, fat absorption is impaired. And maybe this is a secondary effect to not using fat for energy. If you're not going to use it for energy, why absorb it? But there are really big logistical considerations for climbers at altitude because fat's just so energy dense. It packs so much caloric punch per gram. It's double what carbohydrate is. You have to carry half of the packs to the summit to get the same amount of energy in food from a high-fat diet versus a, a high-carbohydrate diet. We've observed the, uh, the mechanisms for the shift to carbohydrate. So there is an enhanced reliance on carbohydrate, and that says, okay, well, maybe if fat's impaired at altitude, we can just supplement with carbohydrate. We have twice the number of Sherpas to take up the food load that we would otherwise have with fat. But even still, with pre-planned meals, trying to force food into the mouths of climbers, we still observe this undeniable loss of lean mass. And there's a really stark contrast around this 5,000 meter mark. There's some loss in fat that we can generally attribute to the increased workload, the activity level, climbing a mountain with packs. There's a pretty good ability to preserve lean mass below 5,000 meters. But then all of a sudden, at high altitude, this lean mass loss accelerates for some of the reasons that we talked about earlier and for some other reasons that we don't know yet. Underscoring the idea that really you probably don't want to spend a long time in this situation. So if you want to climb a mountain after this lecture, after this course, you take some time off to go south for uh, for the summer, their winter, it's nice and cool. What is going to make you successful? What makes it that some individuals, Hillary and Tenzing shown here, are able to climb Mount Everest when others can't even make it to base camp? Is there anything notable about their physiology and the physiology of other climbers that makes them successful mountain climbers? As far as dimensional makeup, physical makeup. They have similar lung capacities and heart capacities. The same sized lungs, the same sized hearts, indicating the same ability to pump blood and to ventilate. Nothing notable there. Same uh, proportion of muscle fibers, so they have a slightly larger proportion of type 1 muscle fibers, the oxidative type of muscle fibers. But it's not extreme. This is within the normal mix in the average population. I have about 55 or 60 percent type 1 muscle fibers on average. They tend to have a little bit more, so maybe that helps them deal with low oxygen at altitude. They're fairly fit, but this isn't something that we as normal recreational adults can't achieve. 60 mils per kilogram per minute VO2 max. Pretty easy to do that with some uh, dedicated training. Their anaerobic power is not anything to write home about. Counter movement jump is one measure of explosive vertical power that we use to approximate force generation in the muscle. Certainly something that climbers will need, and they're not special in that regard. One thing they do exhibit, 
is a little bit of hypersensitivity to a hypoxic stimulus. So they ventilate more quickly and to a larger degree when presented with a hypoxic stress. Now it's hard to say if that was a pre-existing condition. If they are good mountaineers because they had this response initially and they naturally found that mountaineering and going to altitude was for them. Maybe it's learned. Maybe they only have this response now for the years they've spent at altitude. It's hard to say, but this is something that stands out between them and the average individual. Their ventilation is more sensitive to a hypoxic stress. Which is good. From what we know about ventilation, it helps to load the blood with more O2. Maybe it helps support cardiac output, allows you to get to a slightly higher VO2 max, do more work on the mountain, and survive. So we're not sure about if this was an earned adaptation, and we're not sure about the adaptations themselves. These are drops in the bucket trying to assess these mountaineers at one point in time. Their characteristics aren't so impressive, but maybe it's their ability to adapt, to ramp up their adaptations when they are at altitude. Maybe if we observe these individuals at base camp and higher, they have some adaptations that are engaged more quickly than you or I. Maybe they have a rapid expansion in hemoglobin. Maybe they don't lose as much plasma volume. Maybe their muscle fibers don't atrophy as easily as the college-age men and women in our studies that we've looked at. Because really that's, that's what we're trying to uh, use to find the answers when we do studies like this. We're drawing from the local university population. They're not mountaineers. Given this lukewarm uh, description of an alpinist, what would be the ideal, I wonder? There's nothing impressive about them that provides too much insight into what we can do if we want to move to altitude. Maybe we should look at the individuals that live at altitude. Presumably, nature has experimented decided what the ideal adaptations are, and then those individuals that succeed and thrive at altitude would exhibit those adaptations. Maybe we can look to them for ideal adaptations to prolonged hypoxia. So this is a, this is a lovingly coined section on Sherpa physiology, which is really fascinating because there's there's a number of different high-altitude native uh, populations. Uh, in the Andes of South America, there's some in the um, Himalayas and Nepal, which we're looking at now. And comparing these populations, they don't show the same set of adaptations. Before we even get into this, I'll say that I'm going to give you a recipe. There's, there's a number of things here that seem to be ideal, but different populations don't exhibit the same changes. So maybe there's multiple ways to be successful at altitude. Who knows? But really interesting that there are completely different subsets of successful populations at altitude. So these Sherpas carry packs while the mountaineers climb with minimal gear. They uh, have really great exercise ability at altitude. They don't fatigue as quickly. Why? Physically, they have larger lungs and more able lungs. Lung function is improved in these individuals. So that uh, hyperventilatory response that we saw on the last slide might point towards these types of adaptations. So FEV1, fraction of expired volume in one second, asks how much of your lungs air can you get out in one second? And the more, generally, the greater the functional ability of your lungs. Sherpas have a really high FEV1. They also have a really high forced vital capacity. That is, total air that can be pushed out of the lungs. Much greater than lowland natives.
They don't exhibit the typical sympathetic activation of moving to altitude. And this is something that we haven't highlighted so much in this section, but a lot like the cold, and maybe in part due to the fact that when you move to altitude, it's also cold, there's this massive sympathetic activation. And the pulmonary arteries, or sorry, the pulmonary veins, rather, I always get those mixed up, are um, typically susceptible to vasoconstriction. If you're not getting enough oxygenated air, what's the point in sending blood to those alveoli? That's what this response, um, that's the answer that this response is providing to that question. So pulmonary vasoconstriction matches blood flow to airflow. If you're not getting enough oxygen, you don't need as, uh, as high a blood flow. And we see that constrictive, uh, constrictive response in lowland natives moving to altitude, not in individuals that live at altitude. They are really, they're, they're able to match alveolar ventilation and blood flow. So that must mean that they have a greater carrying capacity. They have a better ability to load oxygen into the blood. They can extract and suck more out of the air. It's low at altitude. Probably the most surprising finding of this section is that hemoglobin and hematocrit, the percentage of red blood cells, are reduced in these individuals. By all conventional knowledge, that says carrying capacity is lower. They can't hold on to as much oxygen. They shouldn't be able to deliver as much oxygen to the tissues. They shouldn't have a very high uh, work capacity at altitude. They should fatigue really early. We know that's not the case, yet they still exhibit reduced hemoglobin and hematocrit compared to individuals that move to altitude from, from sea level and adapt. We saw that in the last, uh, last lecture. 30 to 50% increases in hemoglobin and hematocrit. We don't see that in these Sherpas. So a way that we can try to piece together an answer is, well, maybe that helps to reduce blood viscosity if your hemoglobin and hematocrit are too high, if there's too many red blood cells. There's a traffic jam of red blood cells as they move through the capillaries, and that itself would impair gas exchange. So maybe this is a way to keep the blood more fluid and help to support cardiac output. But it doesn't get around the physical limitation that there is a reduced capacity. There are fewer spots for oxygen to bind and be carried in the blood. Despite having lower hemoglobin, and this really throws us for a loop, if we measure the saturation of oxygen in the blood, no different. It's even higher in lowland natives. So that hemoglobin oxygen saturation curve says if you have a lower PO2, saturation drops. Somewhere in the middle, even the smallest change in PO2 makes saturation drop a lot. It's very steep. That's based on our hemoglobin, what we think is standard hemoglobin. Sherpas have less hemoglobin, but higher saturation. Somehow they're forcing more oxygen into the blood than should be possible. And the only explanation I can come up with, and I haven't found any work that has tried to genotype hemoglobin in these individuals, but I can only imagine that this is a different kind of hemoglobin. For instance, pregnancy. The fetus has a different kind of hemoglobin than the mother. And this is so there can be a handoff of oxygen from the mother to the baby. Fetal hemoglobin is shifted up. It has a higher ability to bind oxygen. 
it steals it away from the mother's hemoglobin, which is good. We want that for survival. Maybe this is something similar. Maybe this group has evolved to have a different kind of hemoglobin that has a greater affinity, a greater grip on oxygen. Certainly that would make sense and could reconcile the fact that hemoglobin is lower but arterial saturation is higher. The curve is shifted up. And uh, bear with me, I'm going to really rewind for a second because I think it's probably useful to see that curve as we try to understand that concept. Where normally we would sit on this black line, what I'm proposing is perhaps the, uh, the Sherpas, the Highland natives, have a hemoglobin that naturally exhibits this blue curve. At any given PO2, saturation is higher, binds more oxygen. Maybe that's the case. Oh, I just got a low battery warning. That's not good. Let's um, finish this section, and then we'll come back to high altitude illness next week. We're not going to get through it all today. My computer will die. So what else? Um, when we look in the brains of these Sherpas, they have a higher cerebral blood velocity. So they can make decisions better, think better, and maybe are uh, better coordinated, better able to execute their physical movements at altitude. Um, route planning, maybe that's what makes them successful. A higher cerebral blood velocity. We observe this is decreased in lowland natives, and this is part of the vasoconstrictive response. Not only when you move to altitude do you clamp down on the pulmonary circulation, but the brain, the cerebral circulation, is affected as well. Peripherally, in uh, the muscle, the tissues, at the skin in these individuals, they have a similarly greater capillary to muscle fiber ratio. Just like we saw with the individuals that adapted to high altitude, the capillary to muscle fiber ratio is increased. And they also still have smaller muscle fibers. So the same type of adaptation occurs in these individuals that we observe in lowland natives moving to altitude. That atrophy occurs or is, is evident in the Sherpa population. There is a much greater, what I'm going to call, uh, vascular sensitivity, though. So muscle fibers are smaller. The capillary density to muscle fiber ratio is higher, which is good. So if we can perfuse the muscle with blood, then it washes over a greater area of the muscle. They have a much higher ability to fill the capillaries with blood. Forearm blood flow is our typical measure of skin blood flow, like we saw in the heat stress section, or peripheral shell blood flow. They have double the forearm blood flow of lowland natives. And they are much more sensitive to increases in nitric oxide production. So the muscle will produce nitric oxide that opens up the vascular bed to say, send blood here. Sherpas have a tenfold greater ability to open up that vascular bed and receive incoming blood. So the muscle, even though the fibers are smaller, is not lacking the substrates required to work. I'll put it that way. Much greater microvascular control. Much higher skin and peripheral blood flow. When we look in the muscle, they also share that switch away from fat oxidation towards carbohydrate oxidation. And we see uh, more carbohydrate oxidation in muscle, in the heart, <coughs> excuse me, as indicated by the, the activity of carbohydrate-related enzymes in those tissues. And they have 
lower mitochondrial volume, again, like we saw on that slide in individuals in simulated altitude, we're clamping off, we're shutting off the um, part of the muscle that may or may not be limited at altitude. This kind of says the problem with working at altitude isn't a muscular problem. If it were, the ability to work or create force or consume oxygen to make ATP, then we'd expect Sherpas to have a higher mitochondrial volume. If this were limiting, they wouldn't have survived at altitude over time. But they have survived with lower mitochondrial volume, indicating the muscle's ability to consume oxygen might not be the limiting factor. All told, their set of adaptations, it seems like the limiting factor is in renewing the oxygen available in the alveoli and loading the blood with oxygen. Delivery and usage of that oxygen will take care of itself. But loading through higher ventilation and carrying through this stickier hemoglobin with a greater affinity suggests that that is the bottleneck to overcome if you want to move from recreational to mountaineer to natural survivor at those altitudes. So we're going to come back to class uh, next week. No, you know what? Maybe what I'll do is, this is kind of like the, the gas lights on in my car. Let's see how far we can push it. When the computer shuts down, we'll just stop class for the day. You with me? We'll see what happens. What percentage am I at right now? Oh, two. Okay, it won't be long. So high altitude illness. Let's talk about this as... Um, a side effect, uh, a natural series of, uh, of symptoms that need to be addressed at altitude, that need to be overcome, and are often overcome by uh, acclimating to altitude, taking time to go up the mountain. Now, the different names for altitude sickness are shown here. I got a great picture on the next slide from one of my lab mates in, uh, in my PhD when she experienced acute mountain sickness in uh, Colorado. These are sort of a spectrum. They all result from reduced barometric pressure, so lower PO2, and then the consequence of a lower PO2 in the blood. So the brain is starved of oxygen, the muscles are starved of oxygen, there's vasoconstriction throughout, and then there's changes in, in hydrostatic pressure that can cause edema in the brain or in the lungs. But acute mountain sickness is the first... Um, indication of some sickness at altitude and it's a broad umbrella term describing some uh, malaise, lethargy, uh, headaches, any discomfort brought on by altitude and there's typically 50% are susceptible over 4,000 meters. So this is Katie, um, she was a lab mate in, uh, in the shared lab that I had in my PhD. We went to Denver and we tried to climb Mount Albert, which was the mountain in the bottom right that I showed you, the second highest peak in the continental U.S. We climbed that after a conference one year, and um, she was already slightly anemic, so less iron, less hemoglobin, lower oxygen carrying capacity. I think she was really dehydrated this day, too. She was out celebrating the night before when we went to climb the mountain, and had to rush down the mountain, got carried in, a, in an ambulance to the hospital. And this, I thought, was a teachable moment. You can tell what she thought of that moment. But this is uh, her with an O2 sat of only around 85% or a PO2 of about 60 millimeters of mercury. So she was obviously susceptible in our group of 9 or 10 individuals, which doesn't really hold up to this 50% uh, statistic that I'm showing you here. But it's... It's variable, and it's really hard to describe because it covers so many symptoms. Some individuals, if you're driving up in a car to altitude, might start getting dizzy and feeling headaches. Some people will wait until they get near the summit of a, of a mountain, if they're hiking up a mountain, before they start to feel dizzy and have, have headaches.